I witnessed, recorded, and produced these videotapes of the Washington, D.C. hearing. Their authenticity is above question. This is a hearing about the government licensing the electrocution of people to cause grand mall seizures. This is produced as part of the ongoing work on the website, the way, the truth, and the life dot net. Think of the millions of dollars taxpayers' money spent to pay psychiatrists and their supporters and for the worldwide travel in putting this conference together, while the victims and opponents had to pay their own way. The next uh, case this morning will be given by Dr. David Rothman, ECT, The Nature of the Controversy, Professor Rothman. I was asked this morning to present the historical, social, professional considerations that in my opinion should properly affect deliberations on the efficacy and side effects of ECT. Uh, I am to analyze the context into which, into which such findings must be placed, and I will assume for the moment that the findings will demonstrate efficacy. If, they, if the findings were not to demonstrate efficacy, much of what I would have to say becomes irrelevant because uh, a treatment which is not efficacious or is unacceptable in terms of its side effects simply becomes irrelevant or, or falls into disuse. Uh, the kind of analysis I have to make this morning uh, will become relevant then only to the degree that this treatment is found to have some efficacy. Although proponents all recognize the highly controversial character of ECT, Little agreement exists on the sources of the controversy. To some, and we've already begun to hear, hear it this morning, it reflects the untoward influence of the sensationalist media, the power of such films as one flew over the cuckoo's nest to distort public opinion. Others point to the psychodynamics of displacement, whereby the patient's anger and frustration go on to the treatment, particularly since depression is recurring and relapse of new episodes common. Still others cite fantasies about the nature of electricity or associations to the electric chair. And we also heard this morning uh, that some of the problems can have to do with anti-war politics or uh, publicity-seeking psychiatrists. Whatever the validity of any of these explanations, they do not exhaust the possibilities or necessarily approach the core of the issue. They all emphasize external factors, minimizing the history of the treatment, the attitude of the psychiatric profession toward it, and most important, the ways that the profession has administered the treatment. I will argue that the controversial character of ECT has critical internal sources, and Dr. Fink, I think, already suggested that as well. Most notably, ECT represents a far more medical intervention than is traditional to psychiatry, but the profession has not adequately appreciated or responded to this difference. ECT has more in common with medical surgical than interactive procedures but psychiatry has not adopted comparable and standard medical and surgical regulations. Psychiatry has been proud of the medical life quality of ECT, but generally it has not followed medical rules with ECT. And in this gap lies some of the most vital sources of the controversy and also, I think, recommendations for new policy initiatives. One, judged by the history of other medical therapies, the administration of ECT has an atypical history of significant misuse, and this history is by no means irrelevant to the deliberations of a consensus panel. Although the over or under dispensation of a new medication or procedure is not uncommon, ECT is to the high end of the scale. Debate over the conditions that warrant ECT lasted longer and remains more intense than with most other interventions. Still more important, ECT stands practically alone among other medical and surgical interventions, albeit not psychiatric ones, in that misuse was not to the goal of curing, but of controlling the patient, and often for the benefit of the hospital staff. Whatever the misuse of penicillin or coronary artery bypass grafts, the issue of staff convenience was not nearly as prominent as with ECT. In 1947 and again in 1950, as Dr. Fink showed, the group in the advancement of psychiatry complained about widespread abuses, its indiscriminate administration to patients in all diagnostic categories. Annual reports of state hospitals through the 50s are replete with 
statements about the use of ECT for purposes of control, not therapy. The reports of the Brooklyn and Manhattan State Hospital, for example, candidly, candidly noted that ECT was being applied to make patients, quote, more amiable to hospital care, more tractable. The use of ECT was reported, quote, for symptomatic reasons, only so that patients could be more easily taken care of in the hospital. West Coast institutions related that ECT made patients, quote, more docile and relieves employees of the necessity of feeding or tube feeding. ECT, they said, is being used to secure an adjustment to nursing care, not to bring about a recovery. In this same spirit, two researchers at Stockton, California State Hospital reported at length in a 1950 article about their application of ECT to women residents on a chronic and disturbed ward. I'm quoting, our goals were not curative, they were limited to the level of improved ward behavior. Patients who were aggressive and disturbed were selected for treatment, started on ECT once a day, and continued daily until they, quote, became manageable. Frequently, quote, two or more seizures were induced in one day if the patient was unduly disturbed. If the patient's ward behavior improved, the treatment was stopped. If she again became disturbed and unmanageable, treatment was resumed on a daily basis. The researchers judged ECT a success because, quote, the physical labor of attendance was cut in half. To achieve this result, some patients needed only two or three treatments, others 20 to 40. Some of our patients, the researchers concluded, have received over 100 treatments during this program. Although I think we all recognize that there is a distinction between managing a patient and punishing a patient, the line is very thin, often imperceptible either to patients or to outside observers. Thus, it is not arbitrary or accidental that ECT earned a reputation among some patients and part of the public as a punishment. It was not the pain of the intervention, but the purpose of the intervention that was the determining element. The issue of motive has implications not only for the perception of ECT, but for the appropriate regulation of it. ECT is unlike other medical surgical procedures in confronting this problem. Its orders most closely resemble orders for restraint or seclusion, which also raised the question of whose interest is being served, the caretaker or the patient. Indeed, in both ECT and seclusion and restraint, one often could not be certain of the source of the order, whether it emanated from the psychiatrist or from the custodial staff. Thus, it is not surprising to find that many bodies, like the Joint Commission on the Accreditation of Hospitals, require intricate procedures before an order for seclusion or restraint can be entered, or, and this very same insistence, is now being carried over into ECT. In sum, the history of ECT and the difficulty of distinguishing motives for its use establishes, I believe, a predisposition in favor of greater regulation of the procedure. My next four points seek to demonstrate that members of the psychiatric profession have persistently revealed a deep ambivalence about the use of ECT, an ambivalence which is not so much reflected public opinion as molded it. This ambivalence gives ECT a stepchild-like quality as a treatment, which makes a closer oversight of the procedure, I believe, all the more imperative. Thus, point two. ECT is a controversial intervention among psychiatrists, a fact which inevitably reduces its legitimacy among the outside public. The 1978 survey of the APA reported that one-third of the psychiatrists polled were, quote, generally opposed or more opposed than favorable to its use. If one removes this finding from the controversy about banning ECT and places it into a medical surgical context, it is difficult to think of other interventions which one third of physicians would generally oppose and two thirds would consider highly efficacious. The peculiar character of ECT response is not difficult, it is not difficult to explain. The controversy between those of a psychodynamic orientation and those of a biological orientation is at the root of it. But the result is important in producing a loss of legitimacy to the intervention. Three, there are few medical surgical interventions which proponents would insist are of great efficacy and low risk, but which many of these same proponents and others as well prescribe only after other and more risky interventions have failed. The APA task force reports that only 19% of the psychiatrists gave ECT as a treatment of first choice for major depression. His findings, it notes, quote, suggest that ECT was not often used until other treatment approaches had been tried and found ineffective. Richard Weiner also observes that ECT 
CT is generally invoked only as a last resort because of the, quote, nature of ECT, its risks, and the controversy, end quote. But the risks are reputedly lower than other interventions. The nature of ECT is left unexplained, and the controversy is obviously fueled by the last resort status of ECT. If ECT has fewer side effects and greater efficacy than antidepressants, why should a patient first have to fail on a trial of antidepressants? If ECT is less intrusive and more effective than antidepressants for patients with endogenous depression, why the delay? Indeed, why is maintenance therapy being used so rarely? Part of the answer to these questions has to do with patient convenience and the stigma of the intervention. But part of it also rests in the psychiatric profession's own doubts about ECT, which it has helped to spread to the wider public. Four, few other medical surgical interventions deemed effective by proponents are so unevenly distributed in their usage among individual practitioners and facilities, particularly when the equipment and skills required are not extraordinary, as would be the case, for example, with transplants. Quote, an overview of the psychiatric facilities throughout this country reports the APA task force quickly reveals that there are centers where ECT has never been used, institutions where it has been extensively used, and all gradations in between, end quote. This uneven distribution rare among other interventions, is yet another indication of the division of opinion and practice within the profession about ECT. Five, few other interventions deemed so effective by proponents suffer from so notable a lack of attention in medical school education and residence training as ECT. No other treatment deemed effective is so much ignored in training as ECT, a fact which again reduces its legitimacy among psychiatrists, other physicians, and then by extension among the public. There have been no shortage of complaints by proponents of the hit or miss quality of the training, but the situation has not significantly improved. The APA task force notes, the body of information about ECT is now so large that a simple apprenticeship is of doubtful value, while thorough training courses tend to be few and far in between. Six, few other medical surgical interventions intend to cause a condition, convulsion, that is otherwise deemed a symptom of the disease. Thus, the APA task force, in the neurological literature, the negative effects of seizures are emphasized and concern is great to prevent them. It has often been remarked that a convulsion of longer duration will please the attending psychiatrist and scare the attending anesthesiologist. Hence, the very nature of the procedure is likely to prompt, prompt public uneasiness. When combined with the points raised above, this uneasiness may turn into distrust, and at the same time, justify far greater supervision. The following seven points that I would like to make demonstrate that the administration of ECT, whether because of its controversial stepchild qualities or for other reasons, takes place considerably outside professional or public scrutiny, with the result that surprisingly little is known about the conditions of ECT use. Whatever the findings on efficacy and side effects, Basic information must be gathered immediately about the actual administration of the treatment. Point seven. In few other major in-hospital interventions, is there such a lack of information about the credentials of users or so few regulations governing access to the equipment as ECT? That ECT is a major intervention is apparent. It relies upon general anesthesia. It is so considered by the JCAH in its consolidation stand in consolidated standards manual of 1985. Indeed, JCH is beginning to require that ECT as a special treatment procedure be made part of the rules and regulations of the medical staff with a precise delineation of which professionals are going to perform what actions. JCH officials have the impression, and in the absence of systematic investigation, these impressions must be taken seriously, that many hospitals have made little effort to regulate staff access to ECT. A few have insisted on evidence of special training, but many more make no stipulations. Indeed, JCAH is now, but only now, beginning to define the appropriate criteria, that is, the requisite educational background, training, experience, and peer review mechanisms. Such standards have long been in effect for other interventions, from access in hospitals to chemotherapeutic agents to x-ray machines. It is remarkable that ECT has for so long escaped such oversight. This lack is all the more glaring given the extraordinary findings of the survey of ECT use by Pippard and Ellen in Great Britain. 